Okay, welcome back to the continued discussions of uh, Ken Shelton and Mitch Weisberg. And uh, last time we uh, led off with a discussion of, um, of, of Maud and the uh, murder of, of at his murder and reactions to that. And what we talked about was that this time we were going to talk about how and why educators should be doing better. And we're going to talk about that through a lens of equity. Did I, did I get that right? Yep. Absolutely. And so where that. should we begin, Ken? Well, I think it's important for viewers to uh, have a working understanding or contextual framework around the differences between equity and equality, because I've seen how those two terms are used interchangeably when they're, they're definitively different. Um, equality is essentially everything, uh, everyone has um, access. So you're giving, you know, for example, Chromebooks. We're gonna give everyone Chromebooks. That would be equality. Um, but I will say that a lot of times equalities can lead to inequities because treating everyone the same is just as inequitable as treating everyone differently. And so how does that work in that context? So giving all students a Chromebook, that's equality. However, if you can't guarantee they all have access, you can't guarantee that access is broadband, you can't guarantee that access makes, makes it to where they have increased degrees of opportunity for learning, then you don't have equity. And so ultimately the different, the main difference is equity provides a distribution of resources to guarantee access and opportunity for students. The quality mm -hmm. is giving all students the exact same. So I think then in terms of, in terms of those two, we really want to look at, are we providing access and opportunity to all of our students? And in terms of educators, are you primarily talking about teachers or you or uh, teachers and administrators? What you know when you say how educators should be doing better across the board? Across the board. Across the board. Yes. I mean, educators. Excuse me. Teachers obviously are the touch points for most students on a day to day basis, uh, whether it's face to face or even currently, uh, you know, through remote slash distance learning, which by the way, I did a whole write up on that as well. Mm. But also you have the administrators at the school buildings, then you have the administrators in the districts or the school systems that set many of the policies that ultimately when uh, policies are instituted, they, uh, the byproduct of those decisions filter down to the experiences that the students have. So how does inequity then um, reflect on results. What I mean, what's what? What are some of the inequity, inequitable the, um, results that you see, or that we see? Right. I mean, you can let's start off with first of all. Um, every time you hear the word achievement gap, that is a byproduct of an uh, of an inequitable mindset. You know. You can't start talking about achievement until you first address access and opportunity in the first place. So in terms of looking at achievement rates, you know, there's, uh, the data has, has been confirmed over and over and over and over and over again. Our most marginalized students and our students that are below a particular socioeconomic threshold generally tend to be those that are adversely affected the most. They're our most vulnerable, which, Again, when it comes to education, I, I always encourage educators to be mindful of the terminology they use. You know, when you say at risk, at risk of what? I say, please consider using vulnerable because ultimately they are more vulnerable to the inequitable policies that are in place, which manifests themselves in things like the predictability of success. Why can I go and look at the zip codes of certain schools throughout the country and in certain areas, even outside of the US, and I can predict with a high degree of certainty, who's gonna be successful and who isn't. I shouldn't right. be able to do that. And so there are, there are a number of things along those lines that uh, are inequitable by design. You know, the minute you start ranking, ranking students, so you know how, you know, especially for me when I graduated from high school, you have class rank, that's right. inequitable already. Because one, educators, you can't simultaneously say, we need to encourage students to be collaborative 
you know, the four C's, but then rank students. You right. see there's you see the, the conflict there. You can't do that because here's the bottom line. If I'm competing against you, there's no way I'm going to work with you. Why would I do that? Now, when you take that and then you factor in grades, which grades are a whole nother arbitrary, punitive, inequitable structure that we have. Because, um, you know, I can go into one class and if the teacher happens to like me, uh, one, maybe they'll, they'll give me a higher degree of benefit of the doubt, which will help my performance in class. Or two, if they like me, maybe that's a class where I will, okay. you know. So, so the reason why I'm going to stop you now is that whereas you know, I, I think that virtually everybody would agree with what you just said. And I also think that virtually every educator, not just every person would say, you're 100% right, but I am fair in the way I grade. <laughs> okay. So... One, has that, my response is, have you gone through appropriate and ongoing anti-bias training? Okay, because bottom line is we all have biases and those biases will come out. So when you self-identify as fair, has that been a byproduct of feedback that you've received? Has that been a byproduct of, of reflective, introspectional thought you've done? Uh, and, what and would I learn in anti-bias training? You would learn to be able to identify some of the patterns and habits of mind that you have that do lead to a, uh, a preference towards one over the other. One of the big ones is uh, that, that educators, you know, when I mention educators do better, confirmation bias. So if I, you know, and, and I can speak from personal experience on this, when I walk into a classroom, when I walk into a classroom, and by the way, this goes all the way up even into grad school. The teachers, one, first of all, I was the only African-American male in my grad school program, or at least all the classes that I had. So, and of course, none of my, te none of my professors look like me, none of them. So if, if their perspective on me is a byproduct of their own biases and then the um, information or stimuli that they have been subjected to, they already are going to have uh, a disposition towards me that's a result of that so for example if they say okay um, for example all african-american male men are aggressive so then that means that now when we have a conversation in class if i'm stating a point the confirmation bias in them that they has gone unchecked is okay maybe he's being aggressive towards me so therefore i will respond in a way that's a, a result of that aggression and then if he doesn't react in a way that is expected of me that I expect or that makes me comfortable, then I'm going to react further in that way. And then sometimes that further in that way is, okay, I'm going to mark you down on your grade. And, so then, and that's a true yeah. story, by the way. From right. I, that I, so what I'm, one of the things that I'm hearing is that um, if, you know, if I'm like probably 99 and 94, 100% of the people in this country, um, I am a really poor judge of whether I'm biased or not. And the only way I could really be a good judge of whether I'm biased is if I've gone through training to recognize exactly what bias is and how it applies right. to me. And if I haven't right. gone through that training, then chances are I have biases that I'm not even aware of. Exactly. And so exactly. I should get, so I need to get, um, either, well, getting, getting the training would be in, in, incredibly helpful. Even without the training, I need to get feedback from the people who I could conceivably be biased against to find out whether or not I'm biased. And without that feedback or without that training, almost by definition, I'm biased. Correct. And that's where when we, you know, earlier when we mentioned about educators, I mean, how many how many certification or teacher prep programs include anti-racist and anti-bias component to the curriculum? How many schools and school districts provide ongoing support in anti-racist and anti-bias training? And I mean ongoing, not, not a checkbox. Because a checkbox, you might as well, if you're gonna do a checkbox, just don't do it, okay? But, but then there's also the holding a mirror up to ourselves and acknowledging we all have biases. And in some cases, especially when it comes to school, those biases manifest themselves in the actions and interactions that we have with our students. 
the type of curriculum we select, the way we teach the curriculum, what, uh, what is included within the curriculum. And all of those things are a, a, a pathway towards the predictability of success in some at the expense of others. That's why I, I noticed a term that's being used a little bit more frequently now, which I think is great, is uh, uh, trauma-induced uh, schooling. And it's around, you know, what happens if I go to school and my teachers don't see success in me or don't see a potential for success in me, part of their actions are going to be to help them actualize or confirm what they don't see in the first place. Right. Um, and like I said, I mean, I've got lots of stories along those lines, but the bottom line is there's an acknowledgement that it exists. And then there is an idea that you do need to go through a degree of training and ongoing growth in those areas. A lot of the school districts that I work with, um, you know, granted it was face to face, uh, was in that very area, was in looking at, okay, who am I as an individual? How has my environment and my, my experiences shaped my perspectives on things? How do those perspectives directly correlate to the biases that I have? How can I develop an awareness and acknowledgement around those? Well, you mentioned one, seeking feedback. You know, it's, it's, um, it's interesting when I talk to teachers about uh, and even administrators at school sites about how often do you seek feedback from your most marginalized students, from your most your your, your students that aren't the most vocal or aren't the, aren't the most visible. How often do you do that? You know, it, it it's it really will provide a window into what's really going on, but it does require a degree of of humanity and humility to say, look, you know what, I I I don't want to hear it because people don't. But ultimately, if you want to do better and you want to do right by, by your students and, and, and the opportunities that they have, then you have to be willing to say, look, there's room for growth in this area. And I recognize that I have biases and I'd rather go through the process of learning what those are, dismantling those, and then continuing that growth. Because ultimately, if you aren't doing that, then you are essentially perpetuating the predictability of success in students. So let's say that I'm a fifth grade teacher. Would you recommend that? periodically once you know that I stop the class and say you know something we all have biases and this is your chance to tell me how I've been biased or how I've not been biased what or, or do I talk to individual how do I get that feedback well first of all I wouldn't I would start it off by acknowledging that you have biases that we all do you know there's a degree you know it, it's interesting and it's one of the conditions of being a culturally relevant educator is uh is vulnerability so that's one of the themes of cultural relevance i think the more that teachers demonstrate vulnerability in front of their students the more likely the students are going to um recognize the the genuine nature of saying okay i'm looking at being better and doing better um I would just create mechanisms for getting that feedback. I wouldn't necessarily limit it to, um, you know, a class discussion because there are students that are not necessarily going to want to speak up in front of their classmates. But, uh, you know, whatever pathways to get that feedback. So maybe even one-on-one -on -one with the students, ask some students, at, you know, to talk to you after class or when the other students are at other kids are on break and just say, look, I, I, I want to get some feedback from you. And I know I have biases and I want you to, yeah, I Help mean, me like I said, I would do, I would provide multiple pathways because, okay. I, and I'll give you an example. You do it in front of the whole class. There's some students that might be reticent to speak up in front of their classmates. Mm -hmm. You do it one-on-one, -on -one, there's some students that might think that being attacked or they feel cornered. Uh, and so then, that's why I said, for me, it's like having open class discussions to establish a foundation of, of trust. And then saying, okay, there's a class discussion, there's a one-on-one -on -one discussion, there's maybe in your works, maybe in your writings, maybe in your pictures, like multiple ways so that you get that feedback. And I'm glad you mentioned fifth grade because I have had a lot of teachers say, well, you know, what age is too young? And my, my, my response to that is none. It's right. been proven mm -hmm. through research that has been peer reviewed and published that even as young as pre-kinder, kids develop biases around skin color, face shape, uh, and even things like clothing and stuff like that. They develop those at a very, very young age. Mm -hmm. So to me, the more, and, and I would actually even argue that the reason, one of the reasons why you don't see those discussions occur as much as they do is more so because of the adults than the kids. 
and the adults hide behind the excuse, well, the kids are too young. In the schools that I've had opportunities to work in, many of my friends that teach elementary school and those that do talk about social justice, class, race, bias, all those sorts of things, they have found that when you create the conditions that there's a degree of trust and confidentiality, and these are things we need to discuss, especially as it's embedded within the curriculum, um, the kids, they, they, they will share with you a lot of what they think. And so that's why I mentioned it's got to be ongoing as well. It's got to be a situation where, you know, there's the personal growth and personal endeavors that you take, but then also the support from the school and the school district around the fact that you have to do all these things. And, and it's only, it's necessary. I mean, it's just necessary in general. So I'm know? thinking that maybe we need to make this part one and part two, because uh, this is pretty much the, you know, another 15 minute chunk where we've talked, let's say part one about how and why educators should do better through the lens of equity. And I think that what we've talked about today is that one of the lenses of equity is that we all have our biases and none of us walk into the classroom thinking I'm going to be biased. I mean, most of us enter into our daily work thinking that we're not biased. But what's come out is that we're probably not good judges of that. And right. through the process of talking about bias, race, race sorry, bias, race, um, equity, and through multiple channels, through bringing it into the curriculum, through discussions with the students, through projects that the students do, through individual discussions with the students, even through maybe communications with the students' parents, not only are we improving our likelihood of being unbiased, but we're also establishing a position of trust um, and connection with the students which is going to have tremendous impact on everything else we do with the students. Right. And so and I that's, think, yeah, well, I was just going to add, I think that in, in, in a future conversation, we should also add to this, the, as far as more depth to this, is mm -hmm. the social emotional learning component, because all of the, it is directly core, it ties in with what you're sharing right now. So are you thinking that that should be our next topic? We can add that to the next conversation. Okay. Definitely. Okay. So that's going to be one of our next topics. And um, thank you all for tuning in to uh, our second section. And in our next section, we'll probably, we're going to be focusing on the, you know, the same topic, but adding more of a social emotional learning component to it, right? Yes, sir. Perfect. Okay. All right. Thank you very much.